Our Father in heaven, Lord, we, we do love you, Lord, and we thank you as always, Lord God. Every time, Lord, we are able to come into your house, thank you, Lord. Lord, we, it can be something that we can so easily take for granted. Oh, it's just another day in church. Lord, but we could be lost in our sins. We could be, again, so far from you. We could be in a backslidden condition. We could be dead. But Lord, none of those things are true, Lord. You've gotten us here, Lord, because you love us and because you desire that we would be encouraged and we would learn as we study the scriptures, Lord, that you would open our hearts and, and bring strength and bring, again, resolve and bring, again, uh, motivation to serve you and to live for you and to live right. Because like Job, as we're going to read, Lord God, anything can happen. Things that we might never understand this side of heaven. But no matter what, Lord God, we need to be right with you. And we only find that through your son, Jesus. And so, Lord, we just, I pray, Lord, be with us and encourage us tonight. Remind us, Lord God, of the blessing that we can find when our hearts don't condemn us. We give you glory. We thank you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good evening once again. If you have a Bible, which I hope you do, let's turn to the book of Job chapter 27. Book of Job chapter 27, moving right along more than halfway there as we've been covering a lot of ground, again, in the book of Job, and we will do <laughs> the same tonight. Excuse me, Job chapter 27. Now, as I always do again, because you need to have this information fresh in your mind as we study, as we're reading about again, what we're reading about, you need to remember the circumstances. And remember again, what has been taking place? We've been reading about this debate, this dialogue between Job and his three friends. And, and his three friends showed up, if you remember, because they heard about what happened to Job. They heard about his circumstances. They heard about everything, again, that took place. And it was awesome at first to see these three friends have love and have sensitivity and have compassion that when they heard one of their friends was hurting, they came to him and they came from distant lands to be there for Job. Now remember Job's backstory. Back in chapter one and chapter two, we read that God himself, what, a, what an awesome witness, right? God himself declared that Job was a godly man. Now, if there's someone that you want to be able to say you're a godly person, right? It's God. And God declared, right, to Satan that Job is a godly man. Now, remember, Satan had been after Job as he is after all of God's children, trying to get us to turn from God, to sin against God. But Job, remember, was a man who feared God and stayed away from evil. He shunned evil. And so Satan was upset. He could not get Job to sin. And so he challenged God and said, God, the only reason Job serves you is because you blessed him, because you protected him, you've given him everything. But take that stuff away, and I bet Job will curse you to your face. And he threw the challenge down. And most scholars believe, again, when he threw this challenge down, all the angels were there listening. And so God, to prove Satan wrong and to teach Satan a lesson, he said, okay, I will allow you to take everything from Job, even his health, remember? You just can't kill him. And so Satan left God's presence and did that. Remember, he took all of Job's kids from him. I mean, can't even imagine that. Seven boys, three girls, all killed. He took all of Job's wealth away. The Bible records Job was the richest man in the east, and he lost everything. And Job, I'm sorry, and, and Job lost his health. Satan struck him with a disease that covered from the crown of his head, the Bible says, to the soles of his feet. But even though Job had lost everything, literally, he refused to curse God, right? Naked I came into this world, and naked I will depart, he says, right? Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm still going to serve God. And he, again, proved Satan wrong. And it was awesome. Again, first couple chapters of the book. But then we saw that although Job passed the test, Job became depressed, as I'm sure any of us would be in that situation, right? He lost 10 kids. He lost everything. Even though he was a godly man, he was still a man. He was depressed. And thankfully, his three friends showed up. And again, at first, everything was good. They sat with him for seven days. No one talks. There's nothing to say. They're just there to comfort him with their presence, until Job opened up and he begins to vent. And remember two things. Job, number one, began to question why he was going through this, as so many of us, again, can relate. But then in his hurt, 
in his emotions, sometimes we get into our emotions, right? He began to question God. God, why, why did you allow this to happen to me? And again, we can relate. We can put ourselves in Joe's shoes and understand his frustration and understand his pain because he's hurting. This is a man who lost everything. His friends should have understood that, but they didn't. And so when they began to hear Job question God, they got mad. And they felt that they had to defend God. They had to correct Job, which literally only made matters worse. Now, one of the things that his friends realized was this. If Job, who was a righteous man, they knew he was a righteous man. If he suffered, he must have did something wrong. In their minds, he had to have done something wrong because righteous people typically don't suffer. Only the wicked suffer. God typically only allows that to happen to the wicked. And his friends, rather than believe Job that he didn't do anything wrong, that scared them. Because in their minds, if Job, who was a righteous man, suffered, that means anyone can suffer. And that scared them. And they didn't want to believe that. And so rather than, again, be in fear, they decided no way Job had to be guilty. Job had to have done something wrong. And that was the attack that they attacked Job with. And if you remember from three different angles, using three different approaches, they come to Job and they tell him, Job, you must have reaped what you've sown. You must have caused the effect, right? You must have brought these consequences on yourself. And Job refuted them every time. And we've been with us, again, if you've been with us, we covered three rounds of debates, right? Three rounds of debates. And every time Job defended his innocence, again, declaring that he had done nothing to deserve what had taken place. Now, we have heard from his three friends, right? Last week, we covered the third round of debates, And they're done talking. Again, they've talked to their blue in the face, and they could not prove to Job that he was guilty, that he was wrong. And so now, it's Job's turn. And tonight, what we're going to be looking at over the next several chapters is Job's response. I want you to imagine for a second, because this is helpful in my mind. Imagine a court setting. We've all been in courtrooms, right? Even if we don't want to raise our hand, we've been all been in courtrooms, right? For the last three rounds, Job's three friends have been the prosecutor and attorney. Job, we know you're wrong. Job, we know you're guilty. And they've been trying to prove to Job he's guilty. Job is defending himself. And so, what tonight is, if this helps, is these are Job's closing arguments. Does that make sense? Job, again, is going to defend himself once and for all. He's going to explain again why he is innocent. He's going to look back on his life, and as he looks back, he has confidence that he had lived right, that he did not bring this upon himself. Tonight, again, as we continue on, we're looking at Job's closing arguments, and that's literally what it is. Again, if you like law or law shows, law and order, any of this kind of stuff, this is exactly what you're going to see tonight. Job, again, defending himself with his closing arguments. We're looking at Job's concluding statements in the debates, and the first thing we're going to look at is Job standing by his claim of innocence, okay? Job standing by his claim of innocence. (laughs) Verse 1, chapter 27, it says this, and Job again took up his discourse and said, as God lives, who has taken away my right, and the Almighty, who has made my soul bitter, As long as my breath is in me and the spirit of God is in my nostrils, my lips will not speak falsehood and my tongue will not utter deceit. Far be it from me to say that you are right. Till I die, I will put away my integrity from me. I will not put away my integrity from me. I hold fast my righteousness and will not let it go. My heart does not reproach for me any of my days." Now, if you remember, again, if you've been with us, one of the recurring things that has happened is Job has been crying out for God to talk. That's what we've noticed. 
He's been crying out week after week, and every one of the rounds, he's been saying, God, won't you speak? God, won't you come to my defense? God, won't you, again, declare to these three friends who are attacking me that I am innocent, that I did not bring this upon myself? But God hasn't said a word, right? Those of you who know the end of the book know that God is finally going to speak. But thus far, God hasn't said anything. And so with no one defending Job, Job has to defend himself. And so for the sixth time, literally, he declares, I am innocent. I have not done anything to deserve what has happened to me. But even though, again, he was upset with God, even though he believes, again, what has happened was not his fault, notice what Job said. Job Job said, I have lived right all my life, and no matter what happens, I'm not going to turn against God. I am not going to sin against God. Now, that's a heavy-duty statement because oftentimes, remember, when trials hit most Christians, one of two things happens every time. Either they draw us closer to God or they push us away. Isn't that right? Whenever a trial happens, right, whenever anything happens in our life, it'll either draw us closer to God or the trial will push us farther away. You can say it another way. Trials will make us bitter or trials will make us better. Isn't that right? That's what happens. What depends, or or what, what determines that, is our level of maturity. Now, Job was a godly man. Job was a mature man, which is why he said, no matter what happens, it doesn't matter what happened. If God never defends me, If my friends continue to attack me, Job says, I am going to continue to live right. I am going to continue to live right. You know, Job knew that he would never want to live with a guilty conscience. How many of you know, again, what it feels like to have a guilty conscience? Isn't that right? And Job says, I'm not going to live the rest of my life like that with regrets. I am going to live right. I'm going to be able, I'm going to continue to to live in a way that I can have peace just as I have peace today. And so he says, I love it, right? My heart is never going to reproach me. My heart is never going to contend me. Any of my days, I will hold fast to my righteousness and I will not let go. That's what Job says. But then Job gives a second reason why he will continue to live right. And that is... Job understands that there are consequences to our sin. Isn't that right? What's the old saying? He who dances must pay the piper. We know that, right? That's what Job says. Keep reading. Verse 7. Let my enemy be as the wicked, and let him who rises up against me be as the unrighteous. For what is the hope of the godless? Some Bibles use the word hypocrite. When God cuts him off, when God takes away his life, Will God hear his cry when distress comes upon him? Will he take delight in the Almighty? Will he call upon God at all times? Job, again, was stating the consequences of the hypocrite. What happens to the hypocrite? Does the hypocrite have a strong relationship with God? No. We know the answer to that. No. A hypocrite is wishy-washy. No, they only come to God sometimes. But remember... With that broken relationship with God, do they miss out on the blessings of God? You better believe it, right? You better believe it. Always remember that analogy. I I don't even know where I got this from, or I heard it, or the Lord, who knows. But I always remember that analogy again of having like a plastic clear tube that rests on your head and goes all the way up to heaven. I've shared that with you guys before, right? And I always imagine that again. And all, whenever God wants to send a blessing down, he just sends it down that clear tube. Make sense? But sin is like sludge. Sin is like slime. Sin is, is what, again, clogs the tube and blocks the blessings from getting to us. And so whenever there's sin in our life, what do we got to do, right? We got we to call upon the Holy Spirit. He's liquid Drano, right? He, cleanses that clog out of there so that we can get back to receiving the blessings. And that's what Job says. Job says, I'm never going to be, I'm I'm no hypocrite. No. 
I'm not going to walk that way. I'm not going to have a broken relationship with God. Why? He says, because I'll miss out on the blessings that I once have. God just cuts the hypocrite off. He says what? God no longer hears the prayers of the hypocrite, not when they're in sin. Remember, the only prayer that God hears of someone who is in sin is the cry of forgiveness, the cry of repentance. Until that happens, God doesn't hear, gimme, 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 help me, help me, help me. No. And Job says, no way. That's not going to be me. I understand those are the consequences. And that's why I'm not a hypocrite, guys. Remember, he's talking to his three friends. Now, let me ask you again. Do we understand that there are consequences for believers who engage in sin? Do we get that? Again, oftentimes, I, you, again, especially when you've been a Christian a long time, it's like, well, I, I just got to go back to church tomorrow and just tell God I'm sorry. Oh, Lord, help us, right? Lord, help us. There's consequences, right? And, and they're scary, seriously. There's consequences from the pastor to everyone else. None of us are exempt, Lord. Lord, help us. And when you think about that, hopefully that should put a little chill down our spine, right? Why? Because God sees everything. God sees everything. And it's motivation, again, to continue to do right, to continue to live right. Otherwise, we will miss out on the blessings. Otherwise, again, God won't hear our prayers when we're in sin. Otherwise, again, we could be cut off just like Job talked about. And that's what he said. He's telling them, again, I want to recap. Number one, he says what? I'm not going to live with a guilty conscience. Number two, I'm not a hypocrite. I'm innocent, guys. And again, this is Job's point. Let's keep reading. Verse 11. Job says this. He says, I will teach you concerning the hand of God, right? We'll say it this way. Let me tell you what I know about God. That's what Job says. What is with the Almighty? I will not conceal or hide it. Behold, all of you have seen it for yourselves. Why then have you become altogether vain? Now that's heavy. Look what Job says. Job goes, you and I have both seen What happens to a hypocrite? Let me ask you, can you relate to what Job is saying? How many stories do we know? How many brothers and sisters that at one time sat next to us in church and now are back backslidden into the world and have reaped the consequences, are all messed up again? We don't need to get into that. We have all seen, that's what Job says. And he's saying it even then. He's telling the three guys, you guys know. We've seen it. We we all know already. We've seen what happens when you play with sin. There's consequences. Job goes, I know that. You don't have to tell me. I know. We have all understood that. And this is what he's saying. There's consequences. Let me tell you, God doesn't play games. Look what he says, verse 13. This is the portion of a wicked man with God. And the heritage that oppresses receive from the Almighty. If his children are multiplied, it is for the sword. And his descendants have not enough bread. Those who survive him, the pestilence buries. And his widows do not weep. Though he heap up silver like dust and pile up clothing like clay, he may pile it up, but the righteous will wear it. And the innocent divide the silver. He builds his health like a moth's. Like a booth that a watchman makes. He goes to bed rich, but will do so no more. He opens his eyes and his wealth is gone. Terrors overtake him like a flood. And the night of a whirlwind carries him off. The east wind lifts him up and he is gone. It sweeps him out of his place. It hurls at him without pity. He flees from its power in headlong flight. It claps its hands at him and hisses at him from its places. What's Job saying? Job is again agreeing with his friends. I know that God punishes the sinner. I know that God punishes the hypocrite. I know that God punishes the evildoer. We've all seen it, Job says. And he begins to give examples of things that they've seen, what have happened to other people who have reaped the consequences of their sin. What does he say? God punishes people. The wicked won't last. Their children suffer. Their widows won't weep for them. All that they acquire, they die and they pass it on to someone else. That's, those are the consequences, right? God is not mocked, right? We reap what we sow. And Job says, I, we all know that. 
I all, we all understand that. But remember, Job's friend's whole point was that whenever you see someone suffering, it must mean they've sinned. And remember, that's not always the case. And this is where Job is going. Yes, I agree with you guys. God don't play around. God does punish sin. But just because someone is suffering or hurting doesn't mean that God's punishing them. Just like when you see someone prosperous, it doesn't mean that God is blessing them because they're living right, right? We can drive down Hollywood, right, and, and, and all the actors and celebrities. Just because they're prosperous and rich doesn't mean that's from God. It doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. The bottom line is some people suffer and some people are blessed, and it is not always a result of their personal decisions, right? In, in response to them living right with God. Things happen. Things happen, right? Even in our lives. How many times, again, I can't count how many times where people have asked the question, why, pastor, why has this happened? Why did God allow this to happen? Because you know what? I don't know. You don't know. We don't always know. We don't have all the answers. It's not always because they sinned or it's not always because they lived right. Things happen that we can't explain. And the only one who has the answer is who? Is God. It's the only one that has the answer. We don't ever think that we got God all figured out and we know it all because we don't, which is exactly what Job tells them next. Second thing, quickly acknowledging that only God has full wisdom. That's what Job does in chapter 28, verse 1. Surely there is a mine for silver and a place for gold that they refine. Iron is taken out of the earth and copper it sm is smelted from the ore. Man puts an end to darkness and searches out to the farthest limit, the ore and gloom and deep darkness. He opens shafts in a valley away from where anyone lives. They are forgotten by travelers. They hang in the air far, from, far away from mankind. They swing to and fro. As for the earth, out of it comes bread, but underneath it turned up as by fire. Its stones are the place of sapphires, and it has dust of gold that path. No bird of prey knows, and the falcon's eye has not seen it. The proud beasts have not trodden it. The lion has not passed over it. Man puts his hand to the flinty rock and overturns mountains by the roots. He cuts out channels in the rocks, and his eye sees every precious thing. He dams up the streams so that they do not trickle, and the thing that is hidden he brings out to light. Now, in case you didn't pick it up, what is Job describing? Job is describing miners. Evidently, even back then, people would mine for gold. They would mine for silver. They would mine for ore. They would mine for diamonds and sapphires and so on and so forth. And that whole passage, Job was describing man's effort to go after these precious metals, to go after, again, these precious materials that God has placed within the earth for anyone to find, right? And we can relate to that. We understand that. But notice verse 12. But where, Job asks, shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? What's Job saying? He says, although man can find diamonds and gold and silver and sapphires and so on and so forth, where do we find wisdom? Where do we get that at? We can't just dig for it, right? We can't just get a pan in the water and dam up the, you know, the river so we can, we can find it. Job's asking a question. Where do we find wisdom? Where do we find understanding? Because we sure can't find it the same way that miners find precious materials. Where can it be found? Verse 13. Man does not know its worth, and it is not found in the land of the living. The deep says it's not in me, and the sea says it's not in me. In other words, what's Job saying? Wisdom is not found in the earth. You just can't go look for it in the water or in the land and find it. Verse 15, it cannot be bought for gold, 
and silver cannot be weighed at its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir, in precious onyx or sapphire. Gold and glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for jewels or fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of crystal. The price of wisdom is above pearls. The topaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. Job said first, wisdom cannot be found in the earth. And two, wisdom cannot be bought. You just can't buy it. You just can't pay for it, right? It doesn't work that way. Verse 20, from where then does wisdom come? And where is the place of understanding? It is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air. Abaddon and death say, we have heard a rumor of it with our ears. Interesting. Not only can, I be, and can it not be found in the earth, not only can it not be bought with a price, but the living can't find it. The dead can't even find it. Where can wisdom and understanding be found? Job is again, is poetically asking that question. And what's the answer? Verse 23, God understands the way to it. And he knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he gave to the wind its weight and apportioned the waters by measure. When he made a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning of the thunder. Then he saw it and declared it. He established it and searched it out. Job's friends thought they knew everything. They thought they had it figured out. They thought they had God figured out. They thought they understood why Job was suffering. But we know, because we know Job chapter 1 and 2, that they were wrong. They were wrong. But knowing that the suffering he faced was not a result of sin, Job knew, Job knew that there had to be another reason for his suffering. Remember? He knew there had to be another reason, a reason that only God knew about, which is what Job declared, that only God has full wisdom. Only God knows why he does what he does. Only God. Remember, that unless God reveals something to us, we will never know. Isn't that right? Unless God reveals something to us, we will never know again until he does, which is what the Bible says. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says this, the secret things belong to the Lord, our God. But the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. The Bible teaches, again, that there are some things that God has chosen not to tell us. And that's where we need to walk by faith, right? Faith, trust. That's what the word faith means. It's trust. The things that God does reveal, he reveals so that we'll obey him, so that we will follow his word. But the bottom line is that God has not revealed anything, which is why instead of being prideful or instead of being arrogant like his three friends were, assuming that they knew everything, the right thing to do is to look to God for wisdom and understand that we are not always going to know everything. We sometimes just need to trust in the Lord. Look at verse 28. And he, God, said to man, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to turn away from evil is understanding. The Bible teaches that the smartest, the wisest, I'll put it that way, the wisest thing that we can do is to do what? To fear God. What does that mean? It means to revere God. It means to respect what, who God is and what God has said. That's the smartest thing we can do. That's the wisest thing that we can do. And when we fear God, when we revere and respect his word, we will then what? Live in obedience. We will then do what God has called us to do. That's wisdom. That's wise. That's what's the smartest thing, again, anyone can do, which, again, is what the psalmist said. Psalm 111, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who what? Who do his commandments. Notice, a good understanding have all those who hear his commandments? No. No who do his commandments, his praise endures forever. 
This is the wisdom. This is, again, is the smartest thing to do, understanding that we don't have all the answers. But God does is to trust and obey him. Now, that means sometimes that we're going to experience things that we have no answers for. Isn't that right? And we wished we did. But in those cases, what do we do? Out of fear of God, we trust and obey him knowing that because he is a good God, he must have a reason for everything he does. Amen? That's faith. Again, that's faith in the good God that we serve. Now, in the last three chapters, again, we're going to cover quickly because they're, short, they're fast. Chapters 29, 30, and 31. Job is, these are his final words, okay? And you have to look at it this way. What Job is going to do is he's going to look at his life. And he, again, understanding that he has lived right with God, is able to look back at his life with confidence because he knows he has lived right with God. Let me show you something because, again, hopefully this will kind of sum up what chapters 29, 30, and 31 are all about. Number one, Job is going to look back at how he lived in the past, chapter 29. Now, when Job looks back at how he lived in the past, and he adds, adds to that what he is suffering in the present, which is chapter 30. He believes that he will be declared innocent in the future. Does that make sense? That's what these chapters are all about. I tried to sum it up as best I could because once you get this, you're going to truly understand these three chapters. When you have confidence that you have lived right in the past, and have not done anything, again, to warrant God's judgment in the present, you can have confidence in the future. That's what all this is about, again, as Job, again, gives his final words, wrapping up, again, his debate with his three friends. Let's look at number three, looking back on God's blessings. Chapter 29, verse 1. And Job, again, took up his discourse and said, Oh, that I were as in the months of old, as in the days when God watched over me, when his lamp shone upon my head and by his light I walked through darkness, as I was in my prime, when the friendship of God was upon my tent, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were all around me. Now I love this because Job looks back on the good old days, that's what we would say, right? He's looking back at his past. Seriously, he's looking back at his past prior to the events of Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2 before, again, tragedy or trial struck him. And Job is thinking back, I love this, to when the, he, he felt God's presence. Remember, Job feels abandoned, right? He feels like God, because he hasn't heard from God, is gone. It seems in Job's mind like God is gone. Of course, we know he's not. But Job feels that way, and he's looking back, and he's just remembering his walk with God, how, he, how it felt walking with the Lord when God was guiding him, when God was blessing him, when God was protecting him, and he's thinking back to his past. He's thinking back to that time. He's thinking back to having his kids with him. Remember, this is a broken man. And how blessed it was to have his kids in his house as things were good, again, we would say. And Job is thinking about that. Now, through the rest of the chapter, Job is going to go on and count all types of blessings, all the different blessings. He brings up all kind of stuff of the good old days. Now, let me ask you, is it a good idea to look back at our past and remember all of the good things God has done for us. Is that a good idea? That's a good idea. That's a real good idea, right? How many of you agree, especially when we're going through trials, that that's a good idea? Okay? Because again, this is what Job is doing. Job is recalling all that God has done for him. And this is good. This is healthy. Again, I think this is so important. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Moses, in the book of Deuteronomy tells the Israelites to remember what God had done for them 14 times in the book of Deuteronomy alone. Now that says something, doesn't it? How important it is to remember, 
to remember, because we are going to experience hard times. We are going to go through conflict. Things are going to get hard. We are going to go through depression sometimes, all of which Job was going through. And it's specifically when things are bad that it's the best time just to contemplate our blessings, to think back on the goodness of God, to think back of all the things that God has done for us. I wrote this down. God's faithfulness and blessings of the past will bring hope and encouragement to our present situation. I believe that, right? When we're struggling, when we feel down, when again, we don't see a light at the end of the tunnel, when things are gloomy, when we remind ourselves how good God has been, that when we were in other trials before, God saw us through. That brings hope. That brings encouragement. And this is exactly, again, what Job is doing. The psalmist, in Psalm 77, verse 10 and 11, says this. He says, and I said, this is my anguish. This is my pain. But I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. When God was there, when God moved and did things for me, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. And I love that. It's that same idea that the psalmist recognized. Even when things were bad, hope God was good. God was good. And again, this is what Job was doing, right? Job was doing. Now, we do know that God is good just because God is good. Amen? The majority of the goodness in our life is not because we've earned it, but simply because of the grace of God. And hopefully we can all agree with that. But the Bible does teach that with obedience comes blessing. The Bible does teach that. And understanding that, Job brings it up. Job brings up another reason why he knows he was blessed. Look at verse 12. He says, after talking about his blessings, he says, they came because I delivered the poor who cried for help and the fatherless who had none to help him. The blessing of him who was about to perish came upon me and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I put on righteousness, and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. I, I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy, and I searched out the cause of him whom I did not know. I broke the fangs of the unrighteous and made him drop his prey from his teeth. Then I thought, I shall die in my nest. And I shall multiply my days as the sand. My roots spread out like uh, to the waters with the dew all night on my branches. And glory flesh with me and my bow ever new in my hand. Job talked about all the things he had done. We would say it this way. All the good deeds that he had done. And because of the life that he lived, Job expected, or I'll put it this way, Job assumed that that good would come back to him. That he, what does he say? That he would die in my nest, that he would die in peace, right? Maybe he would die on his bed because he had done right, because he had lived right, because he had done what God called him to do, what God calls all of us to do, right? Love God and love others. And Job had done that. But that's not what happened to Job, right? Job has lost everything. He's lost his kids. He lost his health. He lost his wealth. He lost everything. And it's a mystery. He don't get it. It doesn't make sense. He thanks God for how good God was, but, but it doesn't make sense, which is what he talks about next. Second thing, looking around at God's judgment. First, he looked back at God's blessing. Now he looks around at his present circumstances at God's judgment. Verse, chapter 30, verse 1 he says, but now, presently, they laugh at me. Verse 9, and now I have become their song, and I am a byword to them. They abhor me. They keep aloof from me. They do not hesitate to spit at the sight of me. Job says, at one time, I was a fatherless, I was a father to the needy, Right? I was there to help the poor. I was there to help the widow. I was there to help anyone who was in need. 
But now, these same people that I helped, they laugh at me. They don't want nothing to do with me. I'm a joke to them, he says. Even though I was obedient, I'm reaping the consequences. I'm reaping the consequences. And this is what he's saying. What happened, God? Again, he's struggling because it doesn't make sense. He thought again that these blessings would continue to come because of his obedience, but that wasn't the case. Now that he needs help, no one's there to help him. Remember, even Job's wife, right, was not helpful to Job. Verse 16, and now my soul is poured out within me. Days of affliction have taken a hold of me. The night racks my bones and the pain that gnaws me takes no rest. Job says, here I am physically, <laughs> I'm in pain. But emotionally, I'm broken because I have no one. Even though, again, I helped so many in my past. Job feels like he don't even have the Lord. And so, again, he is broken in his suffering, not understanding why this has happened to him. Look at verse 19. God has cast me into the, the mire, the mud, and I have become like dust and ashes. I cry to you for help, and you do not answer me. I stand, and you only look at me. You have turned cruel to me. With the might of your hand, you persecute me. You lift me up on the wind. You make me ride on it. And you toss me about in the roar of a storm. For I know that you will bring me to death and to the house appointed for all living. Job again is, is talking to God. He's, he's crying out to God. And he's broken. Because he thought again that... He would reap what he had sown. Again, he thought God would be there. He thought God would have mercy on him because he had had mercy on others. But that's not what Job is experiencing. And now he believes he's going to die. That after everything he's experienced, that he is going to die soon. And the only thing that he had to look forward to is that one day God would speak up and even if it was on judgment day, that God would declare that Job didn't bring that upon himself. That's what Job, again, wanted to know, even if he died, that he didn't do this. He wanted to, again, continue to have that peace, knowing he had been everything God had called him to be. Which brings us to the last part. Looking ahead for God's justice looking ahead for God's justice. Again, he looked back on God's blessing. He looked around at God's judgment. Now he looks ahead to God's justice. Verse 1, chapter 31, last chapter. He says, I made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? What would be my portion from God above and my heritage from the Almighty on high? Is not calamity for the unrighteous? And disaster for the workers of iniquity? Does not he, God, see my ways and number all my steps? Job, again, is acknowledging that the wicked, again, God does judge. He says, but God has watched me. God has seen me. God knows that I have lived right. He knows that I have lived right. And so what does Job do? This is what he does throughout this whole chapter. And it's really interesting. Job, remember, that courtroom setting. At this point, we would say Job takes the Bible. Of course, the Bible hadn't been written yet, right? But the picture here is that Job takes the Bible. He puts his right hand on the Bible and he swears an oath. That's what he does, okay? Now, this is interesting because back then when a person, a man specifically, again, was innocent of something he was accused of doing, what they would do is they would take an oath. They would take an oath, again, declaring their innocence, and they would ask that if it could be proven that they did something wrong, and until it could be proven that they did something wrong, that they would be accepted as innocent. That's what Job is doing. And Job is going to do this. He's going to say, if I did something wrong, then may I suffer the consequences that I deserve for those actions. And that's what this whole chapter is all 
about, okay? This is Job claiming to be innocent in order to clear his name. Now, throughout the rest of the chapter, there are 16 if-then statements, okay? Job says 16 times, if I sinned in this way, then may I be cursed with these consequences. And he's going to do it 16 times. And he's going to cover all sorts of different subjects. All of the subjects, interesting enough, if you've been with us already, Job's three friends accuse Job of doing. And so Job is going to bring every one of those instances up, and he's going to declare, if I did it wrong, then may I be cursed with this judgment. If I did this, may I be judged with this. If I did this, may I be judged with this. And again, he does this 16 times. Very, very interesting. And again, I'm not going to take you through all of those 16 times, but here's how it ends. Job ends his final words after taking this oath, wishing that God would speak wishing that God would defend him, wishing that God would tell Job's three friends, and likely, remember, there was likely a crowd of people around, that Job didn't do this, that Job was innocent, after all, clearing Job's name. Look at verse 35 as we close. Oh, Job says, that I had someone to hear me, here is my signature, right? I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up here. I'm signing it off. Let the Almighty answer me. Oh, that I had the indictment written by my adversary. Surely I would carry it on my shoulder. I would bind it on me as a crown. I would give him an account of all my steps. Like a prince, I would approach him. What Job wishes, get this, it's kind of interesting. Job wishes that God would write down on a piece of paper. That's what he's saying. New King James, I believe it says on a book. Job wished that a, a God would write a book down telling Job's story. Does that sound kind of interesting? That's what he wants. And Job says, if I had that book, if there was a book of my story that told that I was innocent, that's all I want. Because I lived right, and I tried my best to honor God. And again, I, I don't want people to think that I was a flake or a hypocrite. I don't want to make God look bad as if I did something wrong. I want to die knowing that someday, right, my name will be cleared. There will be a book written that clears my name. Isn't that beautiful? Wouldn't you know God gave us the book of Job, right? God answered Job's prayer. We'll pick it up next time again as someone else. Interesting, I encourage you to read ahead, joins the conversation. Let's pray tonight. Let's pray. Again, Lord, we thank you tonight as always, Lord, for your word. And I thank you, Lord, again, just as we've read the, the confidence Job had. Oh, Lord, help us, Lord, to live and to honor you in such a way that we would have confidence, Lord, that our heart would not condemn us, that there wouldn't be secrets or sins or anything, Lord God, that we would feel guilty about, but that we would know, Lord God, that because we have strived to honor you in every way, Lord God, that we would have that peace to be able to declare it, Lord. How incredible that is, Lord God. Let us be motivated, Lord, to be who you've called us to be, not to be hypocrites, Lord. Not to be those that play with sin and, and, and whose sin, again, blocks your blessings from reaching us. But let us, again, be able to be like Job, Lord God, that we, again, would be able to tell others, even like the Apostle Paul, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I've done what you called us to do. Let that be our heart, Lord. We, we love you, Lord. We thank you again for your word, Lord. Let your spirit continue to teach us as we need to hear from you always, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.